How's it going everybody? My name's Dave Whipple and you're watching Bush Radical. In this video I'm going to run down the top 10 things that I learned while I was on the show alone on the History Channel. Number 10, trust your compass. In season 4 there was two people. One person was dropped off where your site was going to be. The other person was dropped off X amount of miles away. It was supposed to be roughly 10 miles. I probably walked 20 because I never walked in a straight line for more than a second. The visibility was so poor on Vancouver Island. It was so brushy, it was so thick and so dense. Most of the time I would pull my compass up, get it to where I, I was on my bearing, I would sight something 50 feet ahead of me. By the time I walked to that object, that tree or that bush or whatever, and then when I got to it, I always thought, okay, if I've been going this way, the next object I'm gonna walk to is right there. And I almost always was off 30 degrees, 45 degrees, with no sun and no shadows and just rain all the time. And everything looks exactly the same when you're down inside the bush like that. I found that I was never right, or very seldom. It was only a rare chance that I was still going the right direction. I was always looking at my compass and going, wow, I'm way off. Had I not followed my compass, I would have walked in a circle quick because there's no way I could keep my bearings in that thick a country. Ironically, all the time I felt like I was walking in a circle when I was in fact mostly walking a straight line. Without a compass, I would have probably felt like I was walking a straight line and I would have walked right in a circle. I'd have never got anywhere whatsoever if I would have trusted my own sense of direction and not my compass. Number nine, I learned how to fish. Now, I've been fishing my whole life. I went into season four of Alone, it being a strong suit, in my opinion. But out on Vancouver Island, I had to completely readjust what I thought I was going to do in regards to fishing. The problem with fishing on Vancouver Island was that all of the barnacles, all of the clams, all of the, the rocks on the bottom, everything is sharp. Everything snags your hook everything snags your sinker. So having 25 hooks right from the very beginning, the first day I think we lost four. If we lose our 25 hooks, we're done. Either the, your sinker gets snagged or your hook gets snagged. There had to be a way to get around this so that we didn't lose our 25 hooks and our only real source of food. I took 100 yards of 10 pound test, 100 yards of 20 pound test, I took 100 yards of 50 pound test. What I would do is I would take my fishing line and I would tie a slip knot in the end of it. And the slip knot, you could fit it around a rock, like so, and you could tighten the slip knot up, thereby making yourself a sinker. Now the problem with a slip knot on a rock like this, is as soon as you put any pressure on it whatsoever, the line will pull through the slip knot and it won't hold the rock. So the trick to that was to tie a slip knot and then just beyond that is to tie a jam knot. This way what you had is you had a slip knot on your sinker and once you pulled it tight, that jam knot would go up to that slip knot and it would hold good and tight. So that's how we use rocks for sinkers. How does that save hooks? So what we do is we take our sinker like so and then just tie a loop on the other end. So we'd have this little kind of sinker unit. This was all 20 pound test and then to that we tied our 50 pound test and up above we tied a hook. So we had a 20 pound test breakaway sinker. If it got snagged in the rocks, you just pull and it would bust off. And your 50 pound test with your hook, you could reel it in, you could tie another rock on, we could do this forever. 100 yards of 20 pound test, you're using about a foot at a time. Yeah, there's rocks everywhere, that wasn't a problem. With the 50 pound test tied to the fishing hook, what it would do is it would either straighten the hook out or it would rip the clam or whatever that it was snagged on. But 99% of the time we got our hook back. Now after you straightened the hook six or seven times, generally it would break. But we left there seven weeks later, we still had some of our 25 hooks. So this system really, really made the difference. If the hook got snagged, the 50 pound test could straighten it out and you get the hook back. If the sinker got snagged, which happened all the time, you just pull it and it would break away. That method is something just to file away for survival fishing anywhere in the world that you are. Any stone that's not too round can be turned into a sinker. 
And as long as you've got a heavier line, like a 50 pound test, and a lighter line, like a 20, you can make a breakaway sinker. That's a really good way to hang on to all those hooks. And they're precious if you only have 25. Number eight, keep one set of clothes dry. All the time I was hiking, I would be just drenched with sweat and it's raining all the time. So all my clothes are soaking wet. Underneath my raincoat, underneath my rain pants, everything is just drenched. And I would get to where I was setting up camp on my hike. I'd take all that stuff off and I had in my pack, I had a change of clothes. I had a merino wool shirt, I had like a set of long johns and I had uh, a really heavy cable knit sweater. To go from soaking wet clothes in the evening to putting all that dry clothing on, it was so good for morale. It was just it's just wonderful feeling. You climb into your bag and you're nice and toasty. Your, your, your body has a chance to rest. Conversely, when I'd wake up in the morning and get ready to hike again, there was always that temptation that I could, I'll leave this stuff on because this dry clothing feels so good. But I knew that if I got to the end of the day and I didn't have it, and I had to get in my sleeping bag with wet clothes. You know, what if my sleeping bag was wet? And I'd be wet clothes in a wet bag. I'd have no dry clothes. The chances of, of getting good enough weather to dry my clothes out, especially on the hike, slim to none. So if you have the ability, just a, just a small little cheap dry bag from Walmart, if you can keep a set of clothes dry, despite the temptation to wear those the next day, put them away because you're gonna want them later on. Number seven, beware of fire in your shelter. Brooke and I learned this on season four the hard way. On our first shelter that Brooke had built, uh, there was a time we caught the, the chimney on fire and I didn't get it on camera. I had the camera and I turned it on or turned it off and I had had it on, I don't remember which, but I didn't get that footage. But when we built our cabin, if you see season four, we built this uh, stockade style cabin. We had a section off the back where it was open through the wall and we had a fire ring back there and we had what we called the chimney, which is a bunch of poles leaned up against the, the side of the building. It wasn't actually a chimney in that it, you know, the smoke went up the chimney. It just kept the rain and the wind from blowing in while it had enough opening that the smoke could filter out. We used really wet poles over top of that fire. The problem with fires inside shelters, and you guys have seen this if you've watched season six of Alone, I think people had problems on maybe season three, season five, I don't remember, but it's, it's not a new theme. Catching your shelter on fire is probably inevitable if you have a fire inside your shelter. Sooner or later you're gonna have a fire to put out. But it's so beneficial to have a fire inside your shelter that it's worth the risk but it's just one of those things that you need the most diligence for. Even if the wood inside your shelter is really wet, even a small fire eventually is gonna dry it out to where it's gonna be much more susceptible to light on fire. Um, on season six up on the Great Slave Lake there was a contestant who had a shelter fire and it was catastrophic. Um, that could happen to anybody. It's part of the deal when you have an indoor fire. The more comfortable that you get with it, the more the danger is that it's going to be a problem. Alone is always shot going into the cold season. So the colder it gets, the more heat you want, the more comfortable you get with the fact that you have an indoor fire. And then pretty soon you're complacent. And then flames are a little bit too high, they catch something on fire, you burn yourself out of your shelter. Just something to think about. Number six, treat your tools like gold. The longer we were there, the more dependent on the fire we were, our bow saw and our ax started to become so important. Everything hinged on those two tools. There was a time when I nearly broke the bow saw and uh, there was a couple times where I, I, I misstruck with the ax and hit the handle on the end of a block of wood, which is an easy way to bust it and that would have been game over. So right from the very beginning, if you treat every tool that you have as if you're going to break it if you're not careful, that's probably the best way to look at it because you probably are gonna break it if you're not careful. Then it could be a complete game changer and you may have to change everything that you're doing uh, to compensate for a tool that you don't have anymore. And even at that, you know, it, you might not be able to do enough. That might be the, the straw that, that breaks the camel's back and, and you're gone. 
Number five, one thing that I learned during the filming of Alone was that slow is the only way to operate in that kind of a situation. Hiking super, super slow. Operating super slow. Nine times out of 10 for me in the wilderness, the most dangerous thing is a pace. I know that doesn't sound cool, you know, it's not wild animals or, or lightning or, or whatever, you know, it's pace. The faster you travel through the woods, uh, the more injuries you get to your hands, uh, to your eyes sometimes, to, to your shins especially. I don't know how many times I've stepped on a stick and popped the other end of it up and then just gouged it into my other shin. Twisted ankles, twisted knees. Mechanical injury is probably, in my opinion, probably the single most dangerous thing in the woods. And getting a mechanical injury or not getting a mechanical injury, nine times out of 10 comes down to how fast you're moving. If you watch the old Bear Grylls show, right? Bear Grylls was always hauling butt through the woods. He was like doing CrossFit all the time, you know, running 10 miles an hour and jumping over this and climbing over that. And One year I read his biography and when he was in the British military, they did a lot of exercises which were traveling exercises at night where they would be running from point A to point B in the dark or they'd be maybe it'd be a couple days and they'd be traversing 30 miles and they had a time that they had to get to the other end it's this fast-paced wilderness travel and if you watch a show that's exactly what it is but that's not the reality speed is your enemy most of the time taking it cautiously, watching where you step, hiking as slow as possible, being as judicious and as careful as you possibly can with where you step, where you allow yourself to walk. During my entire hike from point A to point B on Vancouver Island, which was 15 miles as crooked as I walked it, in the worst, thickest country I've ever been in in my life, I, I didn't even get a cut. I didn't get a scratch, I didn't get a bruise, I didn't get nothing because I hiked like a turtle. I mean, I was the oldest guy that was hiking. I hiked so slow and was so careful. You know, the pack was like 70, 75 pounds and after it got soaking wet with rain, I don't know how much it weighed. But hiking super, super slow got me through all of that with no injuries whatsoever. Uh, no injuries to my eyes, I was wearing my glasses. I generally don't wear glasses when I film because I can see, you know, I can see a bunch of reflection in them. But when I was hiking, I was wearing my glasses all the time. I also had a thick pair of rubber gloves. I never took them off even though I wanted to. I really think if I was going to really push it on that hike, I'd have got hurt. I'd have got hurt quick because I did a lot of country that was where the visibility was almost next to nothing. You couldn't see what you're walking on because the vegetation was so thick. The tripping and falling and all that stuff. All of it is avoidable just by slowing the pace down. Number four, that adaptability is so much more important than your bushcraft skills. At boot camp, everyone is trying to one-up the other person. People were trying to show that they knew 10 different primitive fires and 10 different shelters. And they, it was this big knowledge swap everyone was trying to, to show. The producers show, the, show the, the evaluators and stuff what they knew. But really, when you're out in the field, generally only one way is going to be the right way to do it. Only one way is going to be the efficient way to, to do a certain thing in a certain environment. So a lot of times, you, you were, you'd fall back on adaptability. You'd always be trying to figure out how to make something work the way you wanted it to, uh, going about it a completely different way that you hadn't anticipated. Adaptability is way more important than a, an encyclopedic knowledge of bushcraft skills. Because even if you know every way to do stuff in the wilderness, you might have to invent another way in a particular environment. You might find that in the environment you're in, only one thing that you know how to do works in that environment. So it's all about adaptability. Number three, hot rocks. Now I'd been using hot rocks in my sleeping bag for a few years and I'd always enjoyed it. Take a couple good sized rocks, warm them up by the fire before you go to bed. Uh, make sure they're not going to burn you. They're not hot enough to like burn your bare skin. 
wrap them up in some extra clothing, put them in your sleeping bag. I would sleep with one big rock down at my feet, stuffed in a pair of pants. I'd sleep with one big rock in a shirt. It was kind of a flat rock. I'd put it between my legs, right at my crotch. I had another one that was about this size, wrapped in another shirt. I'd hold it against my chest. Brooke did the same thing. Being outside all day long and the cold and the chill, you're always working to keep your body temperature constant. So you, you have this strain on you, regardless of whether you're just standing there or you're, you're fishing or you're cutting wood or whatever. Uh, you're always burning calories trying to stay warm. So at night, it was super beneficial to sleep with hot rocks because it gave your body a chance to totally relax. It didn't have to work to keep you warm. The rocks would keep you warm. And in a sleeping bag with three big rocks like that, there were times where it was as good as being in a hot tub. You're literally as warm as you could ever want to be. And you would just relax and, and just get wonderful sleep and totally feel comfortable. So regardless of where you're at, if you're in cold weather, try out hot rocks in your sleeping bag. You know, it's just an old Boy Scout trick, but it, it's one of those things that is uh, more valuable than it sounds. As soon as you adopt it, you realize, oh, this is the way to go. This is one thing that is going to make a big difference. Number two, when you're experiencing starvation and sensory deprivation, you have amazing dreams. Amazing dream. In the seven weeks we were on Vancouver Island, I lost 43 pounds. Being that you're starving and you're sensory deprived, everything is just this monotone green. You wake up and it's green and you go to sleep and it's green. You wake up and it's overcast and you go to sleep and it's overcast. There wasn't a lot to break the monotony of the diet, of the scenery, of the daily routine. So you have, to, your mind is not getting the stimulus it gets in the modern world and your body is not getting the, the nourishment that it gets with a modern diet. And the dreams you have are just like Hollywood movies. They're so amazingly vivid. And it got to the point, I would look forward to falling asleep because it was, it was so amazing what you would dream about, how vivid your dreams were. It was also as entertaining as reading a good book just to lay there and think with your hot rocks against your chest. I was absolutely amazed how much I just enjoyed laying there thinking. I look forward to it like like it was the paper showing up in the mail or it was an episode of your favorite show or something. You know the combination of no food and, and no you know stimulus other than just the natural world. It was really something. I wouldn't have thought that beforehand but having experienced it it's definitely something I, I didn't expect and it was really an amazing experience. And the number one thing that I learned from being on alone, number one, being on alone, you learn how to suffer. Maybe you know how to suffer already. Maybe you've been through the Marines or something like that, or maybe you've uh, maybe you've starved before for some reason or another, or had a a large wilderness expedition. For instance, I know Jim Baird, who was one of the winners of season four. Uh, Jim had done a solo trek across the Angaba Peninsula, which is the far north end of Quebec, I believe. And I think he traveled 300 miles in the wintertime by himself. So he knew what that was like, that, that wilderness isolation experience. Uh, myself, I had um, I, I fought uh, intestinal disorder in my early 30s, and I got down to 139 pounds at one time. So starvation was something that, that I had been through before. So going into alone, starvation never bothered me at all. There were times when I, I could have definitely used more to eat, but hunger didn't bother me like it does bother almost everybody. If there's one thing that I learned from being on alone, some of it I knew ahead of time, was that suffering is really the key. If you want to do well on that show, if you want to compete and you want to hope to win, You've got to be okay with suffering. You have to be able to, to be happy in a miserable condition. To be constantly chilly, to be constantly hungry, to be constantly wet, and still manage to keep your morale up. That's really the key, that's the secret to the whole thing. If you can keep your morale up and stay happy, even though you're miserable, and you can maintain enough weight to stay in the game, you can win it. So if you really want to get to the heart of wilderness survival, 
you've got to place yourself in a situation where you're miserable and and learn to be able to live in that condition and maintain your morale. Learning how to suffer is the number one thing you learn from being through the ordeal of being on a loan. But it really is the key. It's the one thing you just got to learn to, to kind of get used to and kind of love. If, uh, if you could be miserable and happy at the same time, you've pretty much got 90% of it. If a loan season seven is over by the time this video is posted, Please don't tell me how things turned out. I haven't watched it yet. I'll binge watch it here in a few weeks. Thank you guys so much for watching Bush Radical. And thank you for watching alone on the History Channel. My name's Dave Whipple. Be radical, eh? See you soon.